Hello and welcome to the Sunday session. My name's Steve Judge, I'm your host and uh, I'd like to welcome you to what promises to be another outstanding discussion with uh, two leading coaches working at the uh, foundation level, not only in football, but also in ice hockey. But uh, before I introduce you to Ross Brooks and Randy Smith, um, as always, I'll just uh, share my screen with you. So on today's Sunday session, it's coaching skill acquisition at the foundation stage. Um, obviously, we'll be kicking off with a couple of presentations from Ross and Randy. And then discussion will then flow. We'll begin with uh, the pair of them sort of going a little bit deeper into their approaches to player development, uh, what their aims are and, and how, how they go about achieving that. Then a little bit more on how they're communicating with the players at the foundation level. Um, you know, what are the levels of feedback they are, the use of technology, how that comes, comes into, into play with the younger, younger age groups. And then a, a little more sort of like high toward the end is this sort of the idea of like we're still looking at creating lifelong lovers of the game at, at such a young age. So how are, how are they bringing a, a, an element of fun and engagement into the into their sessions while also yeah, still looking to achieve their their core goals? Um, but so we can get deeper into that. Let me yeah, introduce you to today's guest. So uh, joining us all the way from Canada. I think it's early-ish in the morning for you. Randy Smith, how are you? Pretty good. Yeah, it's uh, already 11 o'clock here. And like I told you before, not being much of a tech guy, I've been up for about 14 hours trying to figure this out. So a little <laughs> lack of sleep on my part, <laughs> but good to be here. No, nah, you're looking you're looking good. You're looking good on that, even despite the, the lack of sleep. Right. Yeah. Well, things are going well. I'm, I'm busy and I think that's... Um, part of what's keeping me healthy and motivated and ready to go every day. Um, the clock, it's, it doesn't go backwards. I am getting older as even as, as we speak right now, but being around kids and sports and something that I love every day, which is, is both of those things. I love not only sports in general, but I love young people who, and especially young people who are involved in sports. I think they, they're motivated. They're, they're happier kids. They, they have a focus. They have something to look forward to. They're motivated and it, it's it keeps me motivated and and doing the things that I love to do. Yeah, and I just wonder if you could just share a little bit of your ice hockey background and, and I'm see where, where you're coaching at the moment. Yeah, I uh I've been playing at, as most Canadians and especially ones in Saskatchewan where it's like a mi minus 50. It's uh not a lot to do in the winters other than to to play or watch hockey. So I started when I was five years old and advanced through all of the minor hockey systems in Saskatoon and then had to venture out like we were talking about uh, before getting on to this broadcast. I left home at 16 to, to start, I guess, basically my career. I was really lucky. I played a year in the in the second tier of junior hockey and then was able to come back to my hometown hometown team, which is rare in, in Canada. Not a lot of guys get to play in their home city, which was fortunate for me. Then I signed a contract, and this is how old I am, with the Minnesota North Stars of the NHL, a team that's not, not around anymore. They moved to Dallas for some of the younger viewers. So the Dallas Stars used to be the Minnesota North Stars. Spent a little bit of four years, five years in their system. Only played three year, three games of, of actual NHL hockey. And the rest of the time was spent in the minor leagues trying to get back to that NHL level. Then probably the highlight of my career um, was I was spotted by the coach of the Olympic team for Canada and went through the process of a couple of years of training and um was able to get to the Olympic Games in 1992 in Albertville, where we won a silver medal. So that's something that I'll never forget. And it's it's a it's something that people ask me about all the time, and it's very hard to explain. Like I think it's it is one of those life events where unless you've actually been in the gold medal game of an Olympics, you can't explain what it does to you or the feelings you have or the pride you have. But obviously, something that I can take with me for the rest of my life and be very proud of. Then I got into coaching. Um, I've coached all levels of hockey uh, from junior. Well, I guess even when I was, was in England playing, I, I took over coaching for the last year and a bit as a player coach. And then when I came back here, I got involved with the, the minor sports anywhere from 20 down to seven and eight year olds. And I'm currently doing U15 um which is an important year for these kids because this is the year they get drafted into into the junior leagues 
And this really starts their progression, if there is going to be one, into becoming a, a, like a, either a junior player or a college player or a professional player or what have you. So it's quite an important year for these kids. And it's a very pressure filled year, not only from the kids standpoint, but the parents, I think, get involved and put a little bit more added pressure on these kids because they want their kids to do well and they're kind of living the dream through them so uh and then i i also that's the minor hockey side of it and then i also run a, a hockey academy called serious academy of hockey um with an old junior teammate of mine um and you talk about one of the things on here is the the love of the game like i've got a, a kid who i actually played peewee hockey with which is u13 we we now call it we're now you i mean we remain friends um we've coached throughout all the minor hockey league levels and now we've started this academy so we were able to you know keep that love of the game all the way now it's been 45 years of, of friendship and then a business partnership and 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 being involved in minor hockey in saskatoon so that's one of the things we're trying to pass along as we i talk to the parents all the time about you know, you might not be watching your son on TV in 12 years, but he might be standing on a bench next to me, you know, helping coach. And that's what we're, we're, we really want is a progression of people that can stay involved in the game that can, you know, let that love of the game, you know, go for, for years and years and years and years and years. So the academy side is a little bit different. We don't have a team. It's just all based around skill development, which is obviously in any sport, the foundation of, of everything. If you, if you can't build the skills um, to a to a level, you, you can still love the game and you can play it and you can play it till you're 40 or 50 or 60, which guys are doing around town here all the time, which is great. But probably the reason that they're here playing and not on TV is they they didn't have that foundation of skills and it was too late to acquire them. So that's basically what I'm up to. Oh, brilliant. Yeah, I think that kind of sets us up later for what we're going to get a, a deeper dive into when we talk about yeah, those foundations. I, I, I did a good job for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll just leave. I'll just leave you to it. If you can just now introduce Ross for me, we'll be we'll be fine. Well, all I know about Ross is he's he's West Ham. I, I think it's called Foundation Level U nine U eleven. Is that correct? That's right, Randy. Yeah, you've done your research. Yeah, good man, good man. Not just a pretty face, judging. <laughs> That's why you're here. <laughs> so yeah, after that brilliant uh, build up, then Ross, um, yeah. Tell us a yeah. little bit more of, of your 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 pathway and your work at, at West Ham. Yeah, so I I um, probably went love football. I've been playing football. Uh, sorry, Randy, I'm going to call it football. I do apologise. Okay. I've been playing football um, <laughs> since I was four, 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 five years of age. And um, yeah, love playing it. I went into uh, coaching probably about 14, when I was about 14. I started, I did a course with... Uh, Norwich City, um, which sort of fluctuate between the the Premier League and the the league below Randy. So it was uh, working with with um, with them, and I got the opportunity of coaching sort of four, five, and six year old kids, which was awesome. Um, I remember probably as I probably not that I should have leaving school a little bit earlier than I should have to jump on the bus to go down and and start coaching the kids, and it ended up being my like highlight of the week every week. Um, and then I was playing alongside it. And I probably realised that when I was about 16 that, you know, maybe going into being a professional football player isn't going to be something I could do. And I started to um, really take my coaching quite seriously. And alongside my um, education, um, I've got some part time work, gained some qualifications and I opted to go and have um, I get some experience rather than going to university. I decided let's go and give this coaching a, a go and really try and get a career at it. And um, then at 17, I went out to New York for a year to do some coaching out in, in New Jersey, um, just outside of New York uh, for an academy. Uh, came back, um, worked lots of different roles, um, qualified in gymnastics, qualified in dance, uh, try golf. I've even done a little bit of uh, hockey uh, coaching as well. Uh, probably not on the on the ice rinks, but on the, on some hard floors and some school halls. Um, and got loads of opportunities coaching women's football, disabled football, working with um, uh, over seventies, like a real broad range of coaching across lots of different environments. But one thing that I really enjoyed was always working with really talented young people, um, and that's why I wanted to go into academy football. Um, and then I joined Cambridge United, um, did some work there, um, 
I was there for four years. Then I went to to Lincoln City, um, again, another sort of lesser, lesser, smaller club, um, you know, probably for those that aren't as familiar with with English English football. And then I've now been at West Ham for, for my fourth year. So I've been doing this for 16 years, despite the young face. Um, yeah, it's keeping me uh, live and healthy. And a little bit like Randy said, I still love it as much as I did the first day I, I started, really. And I think that hopefully comes across when I'm, coaching young young children so okay yeah thanks for that Ross I think yeah a little less of the young face uh, stuff <laughs> and we'll we'll get on fine for the next hour or so <laughs> um yeah I think we'll get straight into the uh, the presentations then um, I think probably uh, start off with Randy and show tell us a little bit of you know when you're coaching at that foundation level in ice hockey what a you know tell us a little bit more about those key goals and how you how you go about achieving it yeah the I, I think in the one the one thing that we're trying or i'm trying to do um with the guys that i coach with at at, on, at the club level and even more so at the academy level where it's not a team oriented thing is develop the the fundamentals i i really believe that without the fundamentals of of any sport it's very hard to progress. And when I say progress, I don't mean progress to the point of where you can become a professional at it or, or make money or get an education from it, but to be able to enjoy the game um, enough to keep you involved in it for years and years and years and years. Um, Cause there's nothing better than, than I go to the rink at night and I see some guys that are 55, 60 years old, still playing hockey. Obviously somebody had, uh, uh, played a role in them loving the game enough. Um, we've got the the thing up here now, like with the fundamentals on the screen. Um, these are skating, puck handling, passing, and shooting are basically the skills that are needed to advance through the game of hockey. There's obviously little parts inside there with the stance, the edges, starting, stopping, as far as the skating, but that would be if if this is a majority of uh i'm going to go full british now football audience <laughs> um watching this to me this the skating uh fundamental would be like running i mean i'm i'm going to assume that in a soccer sorry football atmosphere if you can't run you're if the game is going to be very very hard for you and that's no different in hockey with the skating and there's you know, we hit all of these different things, the actual stance, because as a kid of five, six, seven years old, even, you know, if you've started a little bit later, 10, 11, 12, the stance is so important with where the weight is, where the weight has been shifted, whether your knees are bent, whether you're standing straight, whatever it is, you want to have the proper techniques right from the starting point of that. And then you get into the edges and starting and stopping, which is a little bit more. This is all the boring stuff, to be honest with you. And, but it's the boring stuff that's going to propel you to be able to um, be somebody who can actually, um, you know, fully function at the game of hockey for whatever your reasons are, whether it is to make a career of it or just to have fun with it. Um, so a lot of this stuff that we do around skating with the stance, the edges, the starting, the stopping is going to be very slow moving. And I will admit boring um, probably for the kids. Um, same with the puck handling, like we do a lot of stationary stuff with the puck handling, starting with how to hold the stick, where to hold the stick, why you're holding the stick there, what your hand position is, because um, that's all important. If your hands are in the wrong position, you can't stick handle the puck properly. Um, and, that, uh, and that's even for Canadian kids who grow up around hockey, really literally from the day they're born, some of these small fundamentals get lost in the whole whole scheme of things. So where your hands are, you know, whether they're inside your body, away from your body, which is where you want them, um, trying to develop all those small, necessary, fundamental skills, um, passing the puck, same thing, where are your hands, why are they there, are your hands away from your body, um, the different passing techniques, um, and then you move into the shooting, uh, the dip, the, again, it's all hand position, and when we talk about hand position on a, uh, on a hockey stick, there, there's a, a little bit of a gray area as far as comfort is concerned. Like um, 
we don't have a strict, you must have your hands 8.4 uh, inches away from each other. There's a, there's a base of where they, where they should be. And then if comfort takes you, you know, a quarter of an inch away from that one way or the other closer or farther away from your top hand, then that's fine. But we want to make sure we're in that range. And then you've got the different styles of shooting, wrist shot, snap shot, slap shot, mm -hmm. backhand, um, and even the different passing techniques as far as whether it's stick to stick, um, bank passing using the boards, area passes where it just goes, you know, not necessarily too, well, it's going to end up at a teammate, but more into a space, which I'm assuming is going to be a kind of a big technique in soccer, putting it into space and letting somebody run onto it. Um, there's a lot of similarities, I believe, between the two games as far as the skills that are needed and the way the game is played. Um, I would add in into this hockey fundamentals as they as they age. We call it hockey IQ um, because some kids can have a, a real good base of the skating, puck handling, passing, and shooting, but not know uh, when, where, why, or necessarily how in the scheme of the game to use those skills. And that's what kind of starts to separate kids as they advance up the ladder is basically knowing how and when and why and where to use the skills in the game to make yourself and your team a little more effective. And then also the, the physical side of it, which comes in a little bit later for kids as far as giving and taking the physical contact in the game, which has changed quite a bit in even in Canada um, there's probably a little less um, emphasis put on that. You used to be able to hit or fight your way to the top levels of hockey, and, and that's kind of gone by the wayside. And that's why the, the hockey fundamentals and the skill side of it have become so important, because now it is, can you actually play the game of hockey? Like, we're not going to let you sneak through just based on whether you're big and tough and strong and can punch. So it's it's putting these things in place at a young age and the thing that's hard for kids and it's hard for coaches is the highlights at the end of the night on uh, tsn or sportsnet or sports central whatever we're, you're watching here they see some they see alex ovechkin wind up for a one-time shot and go top corner you know at the end of the night not realizing that he's practiced that for 25 years and the next day at practice, whatever they saw in the highlights, there's a new thing. I don't know, maybe you guys, it's called the Michigan, where you scoop the puck up behind the net on your stick, and then you throw it lacrosse style into the top corner of the net. That's the new one. So now we've got kids at practice. And that's going to happen, honestly, one time in the next 4,000 hockey games at the top level. One time. But they want to spend 35 minutes on doing the Michigan just in case they can pull it off on a Tuesday night and maybe make themselves an Instagram or YouTube star overnight. But and so it's fighting those kind of things to get them to just concentrate on the very basics of all these skills that are listed here, which is sometimes a little bit of a chore. You have to have kids who are really wanting to to improve, which not everybody's in in this in any game or sport to to get to the top level that they're there for fun and I'm all I'm all for that if you want to be in the stream that is just strictly for fun absolutely and I'll and I'll be part of that with you like I don't mind instructing kids in 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 football or hockey based on you're just here for fun but I still want you to be able to do all of these basic skills because otherwise to me the game wouldn't be any fun for these kids and that is a common thing here is when you see kids dropping out it's really only one of two things the pressure from a coach or a parent or they realize in the in the gameplay that they're so far behind the rest of the competitors that it just doesn't become fun anymore and by missing out on these hockey fundamentals I think that's what puts them in that place of not be, not feeling comfortable so we hit these things, even at U15, where these kids are technically, their next step is to be in a league that's one level away from professional hockey. But we hit these things on a daily basis, every day, 
all practice, not, not stationary and not basics so much, but we do do that. But every single day, all of these things are getting worked on and they know that that is actually what's being worked on. And that's the goal. And, you know, they're, they're all in for that at the level I'm at right now because they want, they want to progress, but B level hockey, C level hockey, A level, double A, triple A, doesn't matter. These are the things that my teams um, focus on and, and, and certainly at the academy. Oh, great. Fantastic. Thanks for that, Randy. Um, I think I'll sort of hand over to uh, Ross and uh, give the screen to yourself. Yeah, brilliant. Let me uh, just load up um, I think I'm going to start with a with a video. Um, so oh, yeah, sure. That old good. The, down, uh, <laughs> this, the football guy going right to the fancy video. Yeah. kick off with uh with that um but the reason why i love that that video um is because sort of the, the end line from cancer he says about ronaldino and never grow up my friend is the the advice and i think that for me is and working with young plays in the the foundation phase um as we've spoken about and randy i thought you um shared it brilliantly it's just you know the more and more they love the game the better chance you have of them staying in it and I think for me, I have a real great responsibility with the staff that I'm working with to, to make sure we take care of the kids as they take their first steps into football. Um, for them, it's a really good opportunity to, to learn through play, to try things, um, to build a good relationship with exercise and working with others. Uh, and fundamentally, if they are seven, eight, love doing it, it's going to help them to want to practice and to learn new skills and as you mentioned Randy I think even from for, for me like how I used to watch and learn skills myself um, you know I used to be able to just watch games on the telly and go and recreate those skills in the garden now they've got so many different platforms and different ways of them sharing their skills um, I think it's fantastic for, for young 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 kids now um, to have that um, so really for me, um, I think when working with the foundation phase, um, it's important to have a bit of a sense of understanding of yourself. Um, so I like being a big kid. Um, I like being playful. Um, I like taking away any pressure wherever I can from the environment. And I love the kids trying stuff. I think that's partly because I never really had that as a player. Um, as a young person growing up, I was never in an environment where that was the case. And from years of doing this, I've realised that the best players flourish in that um, and really embrace that. Um, and fundamentally, that for me is my job is this. A really nice slide from Michael Peel that's now managing at Rangers. But our job is really to not put a ceiling on them, on what they can or can't achieve. Um, to encourage them to be curious, to explore through their imagination and really believe anything is possible. But also, actually, they've got to put practice in and they've got to work at it too. So them going and being a professional footballer, it's not easy. Um, it's going to be tough if that's what they want to achieve. Um, so it's about creating an environment which is playful, but also demanding on them, um, you know, through different experiences, through the way you're working with them in training, um, you know, and, and you're stretching them to help them to learn and to develop the skills that they need and those brilliant basics, which I think you've 
really alluded to around is just giving them the core skills so when they're starting to become more of a team player and playing more adult football they can uh, adapt to that but funnily I think children play football to play football and that's really important when we're putting on training sessions we don't want to put sessions on which doesn't look like football they come in to play football and and what's nice I think probably over recent years now I'm I test the environment. If kids ask me, can we play a game tonight? That probably means that there hasn't been enough play. Um, that's like a real tester for me on whether the kids have had enough play and enough football in your environment. Um, I think a big thing, as you mentioned, Randy, about pressures, I think um, is there's always a risk for parents um, to want coaching to look like how they last experienced it or to expect the kids at seven and eight to play like, uh, Manchester City on the television and actually this is the age where they can just try loads of stuff and not worry about making mistakes and through practice and loads and loads of turns over many a years that's when they'll start refining those skills to play at the level um, and to give a lot of variety in the programme so I think uh, the more varied the programme is the better um, so a little bit of an idea around me really um, sort of I try to be quite need centred and focusing on the needs of the kids, uh, what they're working on. Maybe they need a little bit of support on their left foot. So that might be where I put a practice on or some focus around that when they're playing. I try to make the environment more playful. Um, so there'll be some time for deliberate practice, but the skill of trying to get repetition without repetition. So putting practice on or games on where the kids are getting loads of goes without being sort of standing in lines and sort of in more structured environments. Um, as much as I can, try to make it player-led. Uh, I really love it looking chaotic. I think uh, like Ronaldinho coming in from the, the streets in, in Brazil and that, that environment, and again, even my own environments of looking at my background and now looking at some of the England players that are coming through, they've had that opportunity of just playing on the streets. It's a really good example of Phil Foden that, uh, you know, just having that um, and then being an emphasis on developing the person as well. So it can't just all be about being a football player. There's got to be some holistic stuff in there. So helping them to understand how to learn, helping them to understand how to speak to their teammates and their coaches, um, helping them to develop their independence and their own identity through through football without identifying as a professional football player. Um yeah, so for me, uh, it's a nice quote from Steve Kerr. Um, uh, it isn't about the X's and the O's. Um, it's about creating an atmosphere. Um, sorry, creating an atmosphere and an environment which is sort of really experience-led um, and needs-centred. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of a summary, uh, Steve, of how I see the foundation phase. Brilliant. Yeah. Thanks a lot for that, Ross. So yeah, I think that kind of gives us a, you say, a, a foundation for our own discussion here to to move on. And I don't know where to begin, Randy, maybe take you back to uh, the nine-year-old Randy Smith. And, and what did what did the sessions look like then for you? I mean, you're growing up, like you said, an era and ice hockey was very physical, that there was certainly more room for the more physical, robust player than than the sort of skilled uh puck handler that you came went on to become so how how were those skills introduced to you were they introduced through organized sessions or this was just something you learned through just playing recreationally with your friends yeah first off ross that was fantastic stuff i i always find it amazing that coaches regardless of the sport are are so like-minded i wish i was a tech guy and was able to get my little uh clips up on onto the screen there because it's so much of the same stuff and i don't want to go off topic here steve but about the relationships with the kids that's so important like the x's and o's i don't care how many x's and o's you put into a, a game plan or to a system if the kids don't know that you care about them and like them and want them to you want to see them succeed and that you have a relationship with them they won't want to do those x's and o's whereas i think the exactly like that slide said i think it was steve kerr you said that came from yeah 
if they know all of those elements are in place, my, my coach respects me, likes me, has fun with me, wants to see me progress. All of a sudden they're doing the X's and O's without even knowing they're doing them, but mm -hmm. they're doing them because they love the game and you've showed them that you want them to love the game and want to guide them through, through that game. That was, that was excellent stuff. I'd actually like you to, to fire that off to me some way, somehow. I don't know how it works, whether you can do it by email or whatever, but those slides, that's great stuff. Yeah, anyway, to, yeah. back to my upbringing, there was no, there was nothing. This was, I, I mean, I started hockey in 1970, um, before probably Ross was even born, I would assume. <laughs> and maybe even you, Judgy, maybe you weren't even born in 70. <laughs> just about, so, just about. And, and this is, this goes back to a story when we started our hockey academy, people in town, obviously, because we're, we're trying to recruit people and, and our academy isn't based around elite. Um, it's based around kids who want to put in the time and the effort and have the passion for trying to improve themselves, whether that be from a C level player to a B level player, B to A, A to triple A, whatever it is. So we're trying to recruit all different types of players, of people. And it was new to Saskatoon. This was 12 or 14 years ago, we started it. And, and the common question from parents was, well, Randy, um, you, you appeared to do okay in, in hockey and you didn't need an academy. And I said to them, well, I did have an academy and it was called Henry Kelsey School Rink. Henry Kelsey was the name of my elementary school like that for here, that's grade one to eight. And I spent every waking hour on Henry Kelsey Rink. I would race home, eat lunch, race back, get 40 minutes at lunch hour. I would, I would be out there skating, shooting, like whatever, with myself, with buddies, whatever it was, race home after, drop my school stuff off, race back, go from four till six. Or if I got lucky and my mom didn't make dinner till 6.20, I got to stay till 6.19. Then I would eat and race back because it was, it was, it was lit. Um, and I worked on all of the different skills, but not even really knowing that I was working on them because I just loved being out on the ice. And then it became where, you know, there's a bunch of kids down there. I didn't have somebody showing me how to stick handle. My coach from the time I was five till probably 12 was my buddy's dad, who was a mailman. And thank God for those people, because he, he had to volunteer his time, but he wasn't a hockey guy. You know, he would open the door and say, okay, ready, go out. Okay, so my skill development came from being at the rink with when I was six years old, skating with kids that were nine, 12, 15, 18. And if I wanted to have the puck and was lucky enough to get it, I had to learn ways to keep the puck. And I just did that through like we're doing now with kids in, in every sport, repetition, 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 repetition. There's three 15 year olds trying to get the puck from me. Well, I'll try this. Now uh, that didn't work. Okay. I know that doesn't work now. Then I try this. Okay. That did work. Was it lucky? I'll try it again. Oh, that worked. And then I just started to develop my skills that way. And until, because unfortunately for me, um, coaching didn't really become a part of the hockey in Canada, like real technical coaching where skills and stuff, probably till three or four years before I joined the Olympic team. Like I was already a 21, 22 year old kid. Before that, it was get out there, work harder, try harder. Well, try harder in what? Like, I think that's the, <laughs> the most, mis like the biggest mistake coaches make is, well, you got to work harder, but none of the coaches are showing the kids what needs to be worked on and then putting a little bit more effort into that particular skill. And then you're going to be able to do it. So it was a very interesting way, but that's how, that's how everybody was brought up. It wasn't like I was in an area of Canada where there was just no coaching. That was how, how sports in general um, were back in my day. I hate to say back in my day, it makes me sound like I'm like 130, but <laughs> that's the way it was. So everything I did was, kind of on my own on outdoor rinks or playing shinny with buddies or in the backyard or literally on the street. Like our, it's so cold here that we, I could go and skate on my front sidewalk and set up some snow piles as, as pylons and, and do drills. And, but to me, and, and I, it, it's funny because Wayne Gretzky always talks about how his dad trained him in the backyard by doing all these drills and all this kind of stuff. And, and Gretzky says, but I never saw it as like drills or work or anything. It was just fun. 
And that's how I saw it. I, I would do it for hours and hours and hours. And people would say, well, how, how you must have had some natural talent. You must have been way better than your than all your friends. And I don't think I, I was any better than my friends, but my friends didn't want to put in the time to go to the rink at minus 35, you know, for six hours and because it wasn't fun for them. So that was that was my training or lack of training, <laughs> if you want to call it that. Uh, yeah, if you want to jump on the, the back of that, then Ross, there's a little bit of, of see what, what it was like for you as a in yeah. that foundation age group. But then I think there's plenty of little nuggets there that Randy's kind of introduced that you might yeah. want to jump onto as well. Yeah, I think um, Randy, I think I think I was probably the same way. I, I, I can't remember getting coached. I think my first coaching point was when I was about maybe 16. And I remember the the ball being on one side of the the pitch, and the coach, uh, my under 18s team, told me to open up my body so I could see both the ball and the player. And I just remember coming away from that session thinking, "Yeah, that that, that makes sense." But remember at the time, because I just started coaching as well, thinking, "I think that might be the first time I've actually had a coaching point." Up until that point, I mean, any team or training sessions was very much just around running around the pitch for half an hour and then we would go and play a play a game and maybe we would do some passing drills or um, some shoeing drills but I can't remember actually getting coached I remember just getting loads of practice and feeling like okay I was maybe achieving some stuff but not actually knowing if I was getting any better I suppose the only way you measure if you're getting better is if you're getting more of the outcome um, so that's one instance but I also remember when I was at probably probably two main things for me when I was young just playing in the garden I think I was really fortunate to be able to play with my brother and my sister I remember we just put her in goal and just kick footballs at her and she got she ended up becoming a pretty good goalkeeper from it but at the time I remember looking back at like none of us would want to go in goal so we would just always put her in goal and then yeah maybe try and score some goals and hit the ball as hard as we could. So I remember that. There was definitely a few windows being smashed, some fences being broken and stuff. But I just remember getting loads and loads of practice and wanting to get home early from school and then go in the garden and practice. I just remember that all the time. And then the second thing for me was, um, I remember um, every morning um, to school, I, my, my school was about a 15 minute walk from my house. And it was like an adventure going into school because there was loads of like different stuff and obstacles on the way to school, but we'd always go to my, and I'd always have a ball with me. So I'd always like take the football and I'd try and kick footballs through different things. And um, I was always the kid at school that had the, had the ball, but I'd go around to my friends. We'd always meet around about four past half past seven every morning. And there was two um, uh, signs of the names of the street on opposite sides of each other. And we would make them goals. And we would play with a tennis ball for some reason. And we would always have like a game every morning. It'd be like a 4v4, 5v5 game on the road where we try and score through these signs. And I remember at the after when we used to do like indoor football and stuff, I remember my feet getting really good and feeling like, wow, all of this stuff on the streets before school is really, really helping. Because actually it was one like a really good time just for, for us to try stuff and manipulate stuff in the ball in different ways and and probably coming from quite a structured rigid environment in the team training to actually then getting some play stuff and I don't think you really appreciate it at the time how valuable that stuff is but I think now looking back I was really fortunate to have it obviously it wasn't good enough because I didn't make it as a professional player but I remember distinctly my skills getting better from it and I think now those experiences have really influenced me as a as a coach because I I I can't I I can't I just I care about the kids too much to not just want to I can't just put the kids and make them run around fields and just say there you go I just I just in my mind it would go against my values and beliefs and just complete neglect of it that because I care so much that I want to help the kids so much. Uh, you know, I think so much more time now is from me is put into practice design and really thinking about what the kids need and what's the best environment or the best practice for them. Probably because that's something I I never really had. 
Um, and it's amazing now. You watch the young kids and the things that they can do, oh, uh, stuff that I, I would have dreamed of being able to do at eight, nine, ten years of age. So, Yeah, you both kind of describe sort of learning the games through your own play, either with friends, and maybe needed a little bit more structure than you were getting, but clearly a lot of what you learned came through just individual play, just playing playing as kids. So I just wondered when you're then putting your sessions together, as you've alluded to there, Ross, how much does that play into that session design that you want to allow the kids to have that play? But again, you want to have that balance, as Randy said in his presentation, that you know, as a youngster, you're only going to get fun you know, if you can meet the challenge, if you actually have the skills to be able to compete, if you don't have the skills to compete at the level you're at, you know, yeah. you're, you're either going to fall away from the game or if you can't find a level where, you know, there's kids that you, you're, you're sort of same, same ability. So how certainly with the, the different levels that you're coaching at, how do you get that balance and how much yeah. is that influenced by your own sort of? That, yeah, that was really hard. I mean, coaching courses probably... Made, made me go completely other direction because it was very traditional in how to coach and it was very more like set linear here's the coaching points we've got to hit these things here's the structure um, and I think as a new person working and coaching you kind of have to go through that spout period where you're just trying stuff um, and I got it really wrong I remember there was times I look back and just think blimey I was so like like uh dictatorial in my approach as a coach where I just would be like no if like the midst, the tiniest of details I would pick up and then like nail um and then I think probably as times go on I've got more comfortable with my beliefs and my experiences actually that that there's a place for that but actually in society we're in a really structured society both academically and kids don't get to go out now like perhaps they used to so I think we have a duty to make sure that when the kids come in after a day of really structured stuff within a within school to just come and play and I now try to get the same repetition in the games which is really hard but I'm still looking for those details but I'm trying to um through affirmation and trying through reinforcement and praise and celebrating I'm trying to do it in a way where it's really subtle without me explicitly giving them lots of coaching points and um again I think because there's so many different ways of doing things in football to get the same outcome uh I love the kids trying new things and actually surprising me with well we're going to get this way today coach and I'm thinking well how the hell have you got there like I haven't even thought about that <laughs> and it's brilliant and I, I just love that so yes yeah, so that that's definitely influenced me and I think I've, I've probably learned the hard way where I've got it wrong a lot um, and now I'm starting to feel much more comfortable in actually that's okay um, to make it a little bit more unstructured. And with yourself Randy when you're sort of coaching those nine sort of nine-year-olds I mean that like you say you've mentioned that there's a lot of the boring stuff that you have to do i'm sure everyone wants to get straight to the game but yeah where do you get that balance where you know you have to i suppose you have to certain technical skills you have to go through those drills and learning how to hold hold your your hockey stick how to skate yeah i mean that 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 can be like the the holding of the stick and the stance and all that that it's really something that can be hit on in hockey like in a in a three four minute sort of you know, even, even in the dressing room prior to it or on the ice, because I start every, um, now I'm falling back into the British terms, training session. We call <laughs> them practices. I start every practice with something fun, whether it's a small area game. It might even be just like a game of tag or, or something where, because most of the time these kids have either come directly from school um where like ross said like okay we're doing this 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 they need a little bit of a break and they need you need to re-energize them to get them involved in the activity they all love hockey but they still arrive with like i didn't get a snack after school i just i finished my test i was grinding it out in history class whatever it is so we always start with something fun to 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 get them engaged and i i took a uh a young fella's comment that he made to me about four or five years ago 
he said to me, holy, this is different. We start with the fun stuff right away. And I thought, you know what? Perfect. I've, I've got it. Like, because now if the fun stuff is right at the start, they're in, you know, because the fun does continue. Like, but the small area game is always a starting point. And then we'll hit drills with the youngsters, whether it's, it's stationary and, and the stationary stuff is always done really quickly, you know, cause we don't want them standing around and the stationary stuff isn't usually singular. It might be a passing drill with, with a, a group of five kids touching the puck at all the same time, or, you know, within succession with the, within a, you know, a moment of time between touches. Um, then we move to where we progress to all those same skills, but we're doing them moving and all game relative, you know, there's lots of drills out there. Like you said, Russ, where your, your old coach would just get you to run around the field on the <laughs> other Fantastic. I mean, we can skate around the ice a hundred times if we want, but that does nothing, you know, for the game. So the touches and stuff, we want that to be like realistic to what may or may not happen in, in a game. So we're doing lots of things like that to make sure that it's game, game relative. And then, and I think that makes it fun for the kids because they can see, even at a young age, this is going to happen. Like I need to work on this because I did see it last game or whatever, whatever it is. And I'm really all about creativity and expressing yourself for two reasons. I think it really helps with your skill development, your confidence, but it also helps the child identify mistakes and I don't I don't know if mistakes is an actual word that is in sports because what is a mistake like is, is a mistake something that causes something or like I, I don't really like the term mistake but they learn what works and doesn't work through their own creativity I got to the blue line I tried to cut in three times the defenseman poked the puck away I don't even have to tell that person that that maybe wasn't the right play and I like to use what are some other options? And they'll say, well, I could have skated it wide, turned back. I could have chipped it by him and skated onto it. Perfect. I didn't even have, to, I'm the coach and I didn't even have to tell him that mm. he can figure that out as he goes along. So all of a sudden, halfway through the year, um, parents are saying, wow, like my son really grasped onto what you told him about. And I'm, and I'll be, and I'm honest with him. I didn't tell him anything about that. <laughs> and like, what are you talking about? And I said, well, he figured it out through mistakes and that's the hard part for parents is they don't like to hear that we don't get angry at mistakes um because they they, they realistically they want us to make sure that bobby knows that was a mistake well no uh, they're gonna make our job is to take kids at the start of the year develop their skills i tell the parents in the first game of the year there's going to be 150 mistakes minimum so why would I why would I get angry if I know they're happening? It's our job to let them figure it out with a little with some instruction. The next game there's 140 mistakes, 132, 97, 62, 58, 42, 9. And I said we're never going to get to zero because sports doesn't allow you to play it without making some kind of a decision that isn't correct in the in the term of that sport. So but that's our that's our job is to let them figure it out. So creativity um and, and I, I like to create an atmosphere in the practices where and ross mentioned two words playful and and demanding my kids that i coach know that i'm absolutely both of those and that's okay um they know every kid within five minutes of joining my team or joining the academy has a nickname which i've found has been something that is is a is a I guess a tactic that I use to really create a relationship. I think kids view having a nickname um, as something very, very positive. And I still see kids today that sometimes I don't recognize because it's been 20 years and they'll say, hey, it's Johnny B. And I'm like, hey, Johnny B. How's, and, and I'm like, you still don't go by Johnny B. He goes, everybody I know calls me Johnny B. And that started when he was seven years old, but it grew to the point where he saw that as a term of endearment from his coach. So now he, he likes his coach. And then when I'm demanding to Johnny B, he understands that, you know, he's going to do that too. So there's, there's a, there's a, a like, he likes his coach, but he also respects him because he knows he's going to be truthful. He's a good guy, but he's a demanding guy. And I think kids, kids want and need that also. Mm -hmm. If you're a coach who's just the good guy, 
you're probably going to have kids taking advantage of you. And if you're a coach who's just demanding and you show that you don't really care about them, which was back in my day, like, I mean, my friends, dads, I had zero fondness for them or any respect for them at all because they just yelled, Smith, you're an idiot and work harder. And I, I don't do that to kids, but that all goes into the training sessions also along with these skills is, is the relationship building right from the drop of the puck at, at the start of practice right till the end. A coach told me that once at a coaching clinic that you should, you should have at least three or four minutes during the practice with as many kids as you can. And that might just be a five second skate by, Hey, Johnny B, how was school today? Good. I got 25 out of 30 on my test. Excellent work. And then you just move on and you, you hit every kid with something that makes them realize like I'm here for hockey, but my coach actually cares about how I did in school. He heard my grandma passed away. We got a new dog, whatever it is. And with social media, you can find out so much about kids, you know, um, what they're doing in their life away from the rink that you, you can just hit that the next time you see them. Like, oh, I saw you were at the Blades game. How'd they do? And did you see any things we work on? Yeah. Yeah, same power play, whatever it is. And, and it, 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 it helps in the X's and O's and the fundamentals and the drills that you're doing in practice when they know that your focus isn't just whether they can skate around the circle and shoot a puck. It's that you can do that, but plus that you actually care about them. Yeah, some uh, great points there along the sort of coach's communication with, with his players. And I'm sure there might be some plenty of areas there that you'd want to piggyback off the back off, uh, Ross. But um, I think the one area that I would also be interested for you to touch on is that it's kind of the idea of feedback. I think Randy touched on a nice spot there that the, the, the number one source of feedback is that direct feedback that a player gets. So like, I think you phrased it as you, know, you learn from your mistakes. So a yeah. player's done something, he's getting an instant feedback, right? I went this way, this player read it. So next time, you know, they're then thinking about their decision-making process and like, uh, how would I do something different the next time? So I don't know if I read it right then, Randy, whether that is something you just step back and allow the play to continue and maybe the next time the player self corrects or is it something that you in or, or i'll pass it on to ross would that be something where you would you know you'd leave that open question where you know you would allow the player to all right talk you through what he was going to do or you just let the session run or do you know in the training time. session in the training session i'll I'll watch something because if you if I was blowing the whistle to stop the drill every time somebody did something that wasn't correct, um, I'd be blowing the whistle like 150 times a practice. Was that just what, did the child try to make a decision and he just made the wrong one at that point? Let's watch him go through it again. OK, he did it again. Um, now it's maybe a habit and he doesn't realize how to correct it. And it, or it happens with seven, eight, nine, ten of the kids in the 20 that go through the drill. Okay, now we need to explain what we're looking for, what we want from the drill, what should be done, how it can be done. And lots of times in hockey, it's a fast moving game. There could be three or four different ways you could do it to get it done. And then that's when the creativity of the child comes in to where, okay, I'm going to choose this way. Well, that still didn't work, or it did work. And then they choose that way again. And that's where they start to figure out what we've told them. Hey, here's a couple of options to try. And then they find out through their own doing and own mistakes of, geez, that, that didn't work. That's not one of those two. That's why Randy didn't mention that one because I've just tried it four times and it doesn't work. Now I don't have to tell them anymore. Well, that doesn't work. Or I don't even have to mention it to him. That doesn't work. He sees that it doesn't work, even at a young age. Uh, but as far as the, the game management like they'll come back to the bench I, I never say to somebody that was wrong I'll always give them the option of what did you see there oh well I saw the defenseman his stick wasn't where it was when I first started my cut I mean he darted it out there and knocked the puck away from me but what I saw was I thought I had that space okay now knowing that he's going to get that stick out there what are some other things you could do well I could drive wide I could cut back I could drop it to my teammate whatever it is and then that way they're figuring it out also rather than saying to them, skate it wide, because now you're taking all their creativity away. Well, I, I think I could cut in because his stick wasn't there. Well, yeah, but I told you, drive wide. Well, that's that's not coaching in my opinion. It's giving them the, the 
that are out there, letting them filter through them, see what works, what doesn't work. And it's going to be different maybe for each, each child. Somebody's faster, somebody's stronger, somebody's bigger, uh, whatever it is. So one option that works for somebody might not work for the other, um, just different skill sets. And they have to, I think we have to help them figure that out. Yeah, I, I think I'm the, the, I feel like I'm the same, Randy, on that. I think giving them a, a framework, I think is really good. And, and then using open questions to for sort of trial and error, really, and yeah. it allowing them to explore different ways of doing it. And I, again, it comes back to some of the stuff we were talking about, that more traditional view of coaching of, right, there's player A to player B. It's got to go just this way to get to them. And actually, there may be loads of different stuff and it limits creativity. I think one of the big things I have changed in my coaching is before I didn't allow for problems to uh, happen. So I would find myself intervening and stopping when I noticed a problem was happening and they, the players weren't solving it. And immediately you feel as a coach, you know, if you're putting a practice on and the kids aren't getting it, you can feel like, oh no, that this session isn't going particularly well. But actually, sometimes when the sessions aren't going well, that's where le real learning takes place because the kids have really got to work cognitively to work out, okay, what am I going to do? But so I, I sort of try now to, when putting on coaching sessions, I try to create problems purposefully and being really intentional with it. Without, not without making the, the practice too wacky so the kids don't understand it, I, I try to frame all of my communication around problem setting um, for problem solving, but also empowering the kids to create problems themselves. So there's a lot of emphasis around the players solving problems, but how awesome would it be if the kids think about how they're going to create problems for the opposition as well, um, which I really like. and. I think I've tried to change that in my view on it, where it's like, okay, if I see a problem happening, I'm going to intervene and stop it, or I'm going to talk, right, what are we going to do, guys? Um, but also then putting the opposition on the back foot, like, all right, we know this team is playing this way today. We're noticing these things. Let's try and solve these problems. But what, what are we going to do to create them problems? And then giving the kids license to then talk and share and yeah. come up with some different strategies. I think you can do that in any practice. And I, I think that fundamentally is, it's like that individual tactical decision-making. I think the, the better the kids can become at that, the better they'll be within a, a functioning team. You know, if children are able to perceive, act and decide based on their surroundings and think about, okay, the moment or the situation and can adapt to that um, for an outcome. Mm -hmm. um, it is, is really important but also if they're intentionally thinking right I'm noticing a weakness on here you know this individual maybe is uh, not so strong on their left side I'm going to intentionally drive them on their left side because that's going to give me the best chance of doing well and um, what, what sort of prompted that thinking um, was the the Michael Jordan documentary where he talks about a game within a game it really made me think actually when I'm playing, we might have a game of football going on here, but what am I going to do individually within within this against my opponent to to help the team? Um, but yeah, I, I think there's some there's sometimes the kids need you to be a little bit more explicit and to give them a little bit more straight communication. You know, where actually the the level of challenge is so high, they're they're failing, and actually they need a little bit of help, and that's where you might have to be a bit more direct with stuff. I won't, I'll very rarely am direct around in possession. It'll be more, I don't know, like maybe some shape, maybe some defensive stuff, maybe a little bit more encouragement, run a little bit harder to get back. Um, but I think that trial and error is, is a really hard thing to do as a coach. But if you can get it right, um, obviously it will create a much more creative and exciting yeah. environment for the kids. So, And I think the... Uh, as a coach, sometimes we think we have to be always the problem solver because uh, yeah. I, I did this myself. <laughs> and I've started to learn like, as as you get to the higher levels, like right now I'm with the U15s that I said were, you know, they're going on to junior hockey next year, some of them. Um, so I'm, and that's one step closer to their, you know, to being a professional really is allowing them, like they'll come to me sometimes and say, hey, I'm having trouble with um, going around um, John. 
our big defenseman. And I say, oh, why don't you have a conversation with, with, with John on what you're doing? And so he'll say to the, like, basically he'll say to the defenseman, how can I beat you? And he goes, well, in your case, with your speed, make me think you're going here. And as soon as I do this, as soon as you see my feet cross over, you've got me and cut in. So I've, I've found that it's very useful to tell kids to ask the opposite position from them what works and what doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And lots of kids have found, you know, like they're, they're excited about that, that, geez, I, I've just learned from a defenseman what I should be doing. Because basically in hockey anyway, you have to do what the other player doesn't want you to do because he's not, he, because he, he can't defend it. He's not strong enough, smart enough, or big enough to defend against that. There's something that's going to prevent him from defending you. You just have to basically ask him what it is mm. and do that and not anything else, really. Don't yeah. Really and I think that that comes away from the outcome, doesn't it? I think if you're so outcome orientated on that, actually the process of learning how to learn, how, learning how you learn, learning the process of what I'm going to do, I think that that is what the coaches should be placing an emphasis on. Because like you said if earlier, if, you know, if a kid was scoring loads of goals or scoring lots of shots, that might look great that we're, we're getting better, but... Um, that doesn't necessarily suggest learning's taking place or actually if situation changes, the kids can do that again. And I think that that's probably where I've changed. And I think if, if we don't care about winning and the result, right? Like if a, I love what you spoke about, Randy, about mistakes, that's made me think I'm going to, have to take that away and have a real think of it. But if, if the kids, we're happy for the kids to make mistakes and to keep trying stuff, the, the emphasis has to be on the, on the process and not, and not the outcome. The outcome will come. Hopefully, if they're like, you know, when it matters. If, yeah, if, if we're doing what we should for the kids, and you, because sometimes it does come down to personnel. If I end up with a team of U15 players that just aren't very good, the, the winning isn't maybe going to happen. The improvement might be there. But if you have a team of high quality players and you teach them the proper way to do things, the winning just happens. Mm. And, but it can't be the focus. Like in my opinion, I, I, in minor hockey, we have too many people that winning is the focus because in, in minor hockey, you can cheat yourself into, you can win as a coach if you really want to on any given night by playing your fastest player, your strongest player, the best shooter, just more than the other kids. You can do that and that, but to me, what does that do? And it cheats that kid because in hockey, if you're fast, at nine years old, you can just skate down the side around everybody and go in and score or score three out of every 10 times you do that. Whereas then all of a sudden you're 14 and you try to go wide and you realize, well, that defender is as fast as I am. What now? And they, they should be thinking in their head, well, this is all the stuff that I should have been learning when Randy was trying to tell me when I was nine, 10, 11, 12, that I just said, no, I'm not. I'm doing that because I'm skating around here because I'm faster and I scored. Take that. So we have to prepare these kids, not for tomorrow. I mean, we have to pre prepare them for tomorrow, but also three months down the line, four years down the line and six years down the line, because as we all know, in sports, the pyramid gets smaller and all of the very best ones end up here. And to be one of those, you have to have all of those things, the fundamentals right through all of the other little ingredients in in hockey like I always tell the parents if you have all of the fundamentals down pat there is no guarantee that you're going to advance to the professional level but if you don't have the fundamentals I will guarantee you that you will not ever advance yeah. the professional level, ever it's mm -hmm. impossible so some of the parents honestly around here probably think I'm crazy <laughs> because, because as soon as you say to them my priority isn't winning and don't get me wrong. I want to win. If I brought my wife back in here and said, tell them what I just said. And you guys said to, to Barb, he doesn't want to win. She'd say, well, you guys are crazy because <laughs> card, card games, uh, outdoor games in the backyard, whatever it is. I want to win at every single thing I do, but I have to put that aside for what's best for the kids. We have to develop these kids 
the love of the game, the fundamentals, the skills, the camaraderie, the teamwork, all of that kind of stuff, because they're going to be using that in their real jobs because only 0.0062 or whatever the number is are going on to a professional career. And the parents really find that hard to deal with when I say to them that Tuesday's game at Kinsman Arena, if, if we win or lose, doesn't really matter to me. Winning to me is at the end of the year when your son says, I don't want want this to end because the season's over and I really feel as though I've improved as a player that to me that's winning hmm. I'd like to bring in that kind of a cross of the use of technology how you use it and and the fun of the game that obviously the technology also gives the kids that you work with access to clips of you know if it's going on in ice hockey, if it's going on in football, they they've got it on their phone instantly. To point, I think, can't remember the name of the, the name of the skill. Where they're basically just placing the puck over the the net, and that's the that's the Michigan one that I was talking about. The Michigan. So yeah, let me stop there. I mean, if you, you like, you say you want to have to bring that kind of fun and joy into into your sessions, and I guess it's great if kids are coming in and they want to try things, but at the same time, you know, you've 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 uh put out a you know you've got your session plan there there's things that you want to achieve how do you get that balance of going with the flow with kids and coming in and wanting to try things and you see that excitement and you don't kind of want to stop that but at the same time there are things you still want to achieve in the session how do you go about you know getting getting that balance I mean, between the two there's always there's always four or five six minutes before every practice starts where they can do any of the, the stuff that they perceive as fun that may or may not actually be relevant to hockey. Um, but the technology side of it, I use lots of times as a, as a backup to what we're trying to teach, whether it's a, a fundamental skill or a, or a tactical thing, whatever. Because in, in hockey, when I say to a kid, um, you know, here's what you should be doing in these scenarios, some you know there's six kids we call it the rule of six there's six kids that are going to go absolutely randy said that that is the gospel like i know that is the absolute truth six of them are like ah uh, i don't know maybe he's right maybe he's wrong i might try it and then six are never trying it they don't because they don't care what randy says and it's trying to keep the six that are in the middle more lean towards it's right as opposed to we don't care um so but when you say to somebody, you should try this, and you see that they're not really into it, I can send them, and I do this all the time, and I make sure the parents, because where we're at in society in 2022, a grown man sending a text message to uh, like a 15-year-old or a 14-year-old isn't probably perceived as something that should be done. So I always start at the parent meeting, I tell them it's going to go to the mom, the dad, and the child all at the same time so that you guys know exactly what is coming to you, to your child. But so you should work on this play in practice. Ah, uh, yeah, whatever. I'll try it once or twice. But then when I can fire off a clip to them of Connor McDavid or Sidney Crosby or whatever doing that, they're like, wow, he is right. Because they want to see that their heroes are doing it correctly or doing, doing something that their coach is asking them to do. And if I can't find clips of stuff to send these kids to say, hey, Remember what we talked about? Like, look at McDavid. If I can't find those, that gives them the opportunity to say, Randy, you're crazy. Because to them, like I'm 150 years old. When you're 15 years old, anybody that's older than 30 is 150. So like I can bug the kids about playing hockey with Gordy Howe, which obviously is not true because Gordy Howe would, if he was still alive, would be 90. But they think that I'm that old and that I, maybe I'm a little bit far, far gone in the, in sports or in tactics or in skills or whatever, even though nothing has changed in hockey, the same skills are required now as they were 55 years ago. We've just refined them and stuff. And so I use technology lots on, on that, or I'll use it on the opposite side with that Michigan move. I'll find the four times in history that it's happened. And I say, okay, there are how many games of hockey since 1901? 4 trillion, 860 make up some number four times that's happened and you want to spend 15 minutes of valuable practice time doing that if you want to do that in your backyard or at the outdoor rink for an hour go ahead but we need to focus on what makes a hockey player a hockey player 
and technology can certainly help. And, and from the other side of it too, with the technology of, like I saw last night that uh, one of the boys on my team, his dog passed away after 19 years. Now that technology has given me some information where tomorrow at practice, hey, put my arm around him, heard about Sadie. That's too bad. I've lost a dog, blah, blah, blah. And then he leaves and, and says to his mom and dad, like, did you guys realize Randy's a human? Like he actually talked to me about <laughs> stuff that wasn't for checking and back checking. He knew about Sadie. <laughs> I think, and it's not a tactic, but I think I've got that kid now. When I say, hey, I need you to work a little harder. Absolutely, Randy. I'm all in for you. So technology can be a real, real help to um, both positive and negative. Yeah, I'm I'm the same, Randy. I think yeah, you've sort of summarized it really well. I think the one thing for me as well is that like I still watch the games and get like as excited as the kids do. So like last night I was watching uh, Messi in the in the World Cup and some of the stuff that he does. And I go and turn up into my game this morning. And all I want to do is talk about Messi and the things yeah. that he was doing last night. And it's great because they're like, wow, Ross, like Ross, Ross watches the games too. And he's got, he likes the same players that I like and stuff. And, uh, you know, I've now gone for a few different generations of maybe the kid, the players that, uh, you know, that I watched growing up, you know, they're, the, you know, they're now on the TV as the pundits and, and different stuff. So it's a little bit harder because actually yeah. you know, he used to be a really good player <laughs> once in the day, but. But um, I'm I'm picking up I pick up that stuff and I think what's really nice is that you can like I like today I had a game where we were talking about uh, a bit of work they've been doing all week around some finishing stuff and I asked the question did anyone see the the goals from Holland last night and I thought oh, this is a bit of a test like uh, let's see how many are watching the game and all of them like put their hands up and they're all like yeah yeah I saw this guy and they were talking about all the players names and stuff and. I just think it's it's amazing now, like uh, how what how well children. As I say now, it's always been the case, but how detailed the kids from watching games, how much they pick up. Um, and I think modelling in those younger age groups is so important because uh, I can do a little bit, like I can show some stuff, I can show some skills, but I don't want the kids to be as good as me because they're just going to be all <laughs> they're just going to be ordinary at football, right? So I can maybe. Uh, they get to a certain age, Randy, where some of the skills that I can do, maybe like nine, where they think, oh, wow, Ross is a really good player. <laughs> but I start showing those skills to a 12, 13 year old. They're thinking, well, what, this, what the hell is this guy all about? So I get to a certain point where then I have to use other technology and I have to use other things to, to inspire. Um, but yeah, and I think that's the same for, for all the coaches. I think there's certain things you can show and you can do, but to really bring it to life if they've got role models and people they're looking up to like that's another great way of connecting where actually i know this player really loves this this guy so i've got one of the kids uh, there's a player randy called sadio mane who plays play for liverpool and uh he came into our into our building and um uh, he was a really quiet boy and he had a little and he had like these like uh player cards in his backpack and uh and I was like, oh, these are these are great. I have a look through them. I looked through them and I said, oh, who's your favourite one? He said, oh, Mane. And I was like, oh, he's a bit like you today. And he, and he sort of looks at me like, what the hell is this guy on about? He said, yeah, he's really fast like you. He said, uh, today, do you reckon you could uh, go into Mane mode? And it's now been three years of knowing this kid. But every time I see him, I said, oh, did you go into Mane mode? And it's like, that, and that that for me is like I, I own he only knows I'm the only person that has has had that conversation with him. Like no one else knows that. But every time I talk about it, the smile on his face, because he's like, Coach, coach remembers me. This is and it's just that one thing. So I think when you show an interest, if you know the kids like certain plays and stuff, again, that technology in the video can be so impactful because they know that you know who their favorite players are and you've spent time watching players thinking about how that's going to help them I think it's it's a great way of connecting so yeah the more the more you in my opinion the more you know about them the more that they know you care about them and the more yeah. they're going to do not for you but for themselves like they're going to work hard and and do all of the things that are not like even just being on time and being respectful and being a good teammate and being polite to people and whatever it is like it's they, they need to know and that you care about all of those things and, and appreciate all of those things. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that's, 
a, a huge part of coaching. Absolutely. We don't even have, we don't even have like, people will say to me, what systems are you guys using? I don't know if we actually use a system. We have habits that we want the kids to stops and starts, sticks in lanes, eyes up, whatever it is. And then you, they can almost do the systems without even knowing they're doing them because they're paying attention. They're in the right spot. They've got the, the fundamentals. And so people sometimes in our, in our own league find that odd, like, geez, your power play is really working. Like, what are you guys doing? And I'm like, oh, we have some habits we work on. And they're like, what do you mean? Like, you don't tell Bobby where to stand? I'm like, no, not really, because there might be seven different places to stand. But through the habit of creating a lane for a pass, he automatically goes to this area because he knows where that lane will be. Mm-hmm. But I'm not telling him that he has to do that. So it's hockey, hot, well, hockey is for sure. And I don't know about other sports. Hockey is more about relationships and habits and fundamentals than in my opinion than x and o's honestly you have to have the x and o's but you have to have the other things in place first because the x and and o's mean nothing to these kids if if they're not having fun or that they don't respect their coach or whatever absolutely yeah i think you're taking us down to next next level of of game iq and understand appreciation of space space creation and, and denial i may, may say that for another day i think we'll round it up with a, a little question that ross that um you mentioned sort of in your background you coached uh, a few different sports so i just wondered that seems to be something that slowly creeped in uh, with uh, thinking of with player development over the last couple of years this idea of sort of a youngsters experience lots of different sports it's good for their kind of physical dexterity and 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 sort of appreciation and skill appreciation and I just wondered uh, to what level you kind of look to to lean on other sports or you think well you know you're here to to learn football so this is what we're doing yeah I think I need to get better at it I think I've got a good grasp with different sports but yeah listening to uh, Randy today he's probably wanted me to do a bit more digging around uh, ice hockey and learning a little bit more around that I think there's crossovers in every sport so I think from a coaching perspective I think that's really important you're watching other sports watching how other coaches work in those sports and trying to pick stuff up because it's all there, there will always be things that you can implement into your own work but I think for the kids, I think there's a few things um, because they're with us a lot. They train a lot. I mean, they're in three or four evenings a week. They play games. I think them going and experiencing other things is really healthy. Them going and trying other sports where they don't feel their whole life is about being a footballer is really important. I think equally for parents, actually just going and being a parent of a child in a different sport where they may be really super talented at football, they might go and be go into another sport and be terrible at it. I think that's good and healthy for the parents to, to realise that their child actually is a kid and they're not really, really, really good at everything. So them going into a different sport and maybe being the worst, I think will help teach them actually, like you're really good at this, but like let's work hard on this, let's practice this. And I think for the kids as well, um, they like a lot of the children will love playing other sports. And I look at all of from my experience, all of our best best players that I've coached all are really good in lots of different sports because they've just got a real good base of movement. They love play. They love learning. They love trying different stuff. And they're always physically active, um, you know. And I, what the little sessions that I do where, I don't know, we might do like a tag rugby game before training and like – you just see kids very differently in those environments, like where a kid may be a little bit different when they're playing football, suddenly you put a tag rugby in and where they may be struggling in the football, they're absolutely flourishing in their, in their, uh, in their rugby. So again, you see them in a different environment. I think Randy's spoken a lot about it, just showing interest in it. So uh, we have like a reward wall at our club. So if the kids are having other achievements and other sports, we put that up on our wall. So I don't know if uh, we had one, one of our young kids done really well in their cricket game. So we made sure that was up on there, that, you know, that was celebrated. So 
it isn't just about football football it's about all that other stuff um but yeah we've I've done it in different ways. I've done it through delivery in the club. I've also uh, taken the kids in the past to other sports. I remember uh, one, I got in touch with a wrestling club, uh, which was pretty good fun. And uh, we went down to this wrestling club on a Tuesday evening. And I had no idea what the hell was going to happen. I was thinking, right, were they going to be jumping off chairs? Are they going to be putting people into... I mean, I, I was thinking of Triple H, I was thinking Stone Cold Steve Austin, I was thinking, all right, what's going to go on? And it was really good because the the guys, kids got to learn just the basics of how to bounce off ropes and stuff. And and it wasn't actually like the skills that they learned, but just getting them in a different environment. You saw socially the, the children in a really different way, like because they were out of their comfort zone. And suddenly maybe some of those class clowns that you have in your group, you know, which every coach has, they're a little bit quiet because suddenly they're out of their come side a little bit more and, and you see them in a different way. Um, and I think that's really important as a coach, you know, and I think the more well-rounded you see them in through different environments, as Randy touched on, the better you get to know the kids um, and the, the better you will be at hopefully meeting their, their needs. Yeah, we, we use a lot of other sports at, at, from the academy side of it. Um, like cause the kids come to us at, uh, just before one o'clock every day and then leave at four 30. So it's usually ice off ice workout and then hockey IQ where we do like we watch videos or we have somebody nutrition, whatever it is. Um, but then lots of our days are also scheduled where we'll take off from the workout and go uh, to the tennis club or badminton or football. We have a field um just across the road from our rink and this isn't from an instructional standpoint because i don't know enough about those sports to be out out there teaching the techniques and skills and fundamentals of those sports but it's more so to just let them enjoy something that other than their regular activity because hockey players are as as footballers are probably in in uk very busy like i mean at the u15 level we're, we're pretty much six days a week um, games, practices, off ice workouts, whatever it is. Um, but from the club standpoint, I encourage the mm. kids to, to do other activities. And it's, it's odd that the other activities are the ones that sometimes are preventing that. Um, I ran into a dad yesterday whose son tried out for the basketball team at high school and he made the team. And so we've been discussing that. And when I see Jack at the rink, I'll you know, bug him about how many layups he made, or is he a three pointer? Or what's it? What's his specialty? And we've talked about it. And then his dad said to me yesterday that he had to had to quit basketball. And I was like, why? Like, certainly not from our standpoint. Like, if you want to play, because the the game times don't coincide. Like, there's no real issue. He said, no. The high school said unless you're one hundred percent in, you can't play. So now we've we've got a sports organization taking opportunities away from somebody who not only enjoyed the sport, but earned the right to play the sport. Mm -hmm. I just found that very, very odd. Cause I think there's so many things in basketball, football, um, American football, any sport really that can help you in your current sport that you're sort of specializing in, you yeah, know, from yeah. movements, thinking, whatever it is like, um, and it can only help. And I, the bottom line is we're, we're here to, to help these kids progress. And I think the high school basketball guy who said you can't play is doing it backwards. He maybe gets to fill in another player for Jack that can help him win. Well, that's not right. So we, I, I, I love the fact that kids play other sports. And it's funny how when you're like, I, I don't see kids as an, an, uh, as a hockey player or a footballer or a basketballer. Like, they're athletes. Um, and it's funny how when I talk to kids, they'll say, like, oh, what'd you do in the summer? Oh, uh, our baseball team went to the Nationals, whatever, blah, blah, blah. I was third best hitter in the league. And, uh, and it doesn't surprise me because they're athletes. And, you know, or, the, or I do have kids that play high level uh, football as hockey players. And Oh yeah, we you know I scored three goals. Um, I'm, I was the top striker in in Western Canada. I had twenty nine goals. The other guy only beat me by one. Whatever, blah blah blah. 
and because they're athletes, it doesn't surprise me that they do well in other sports because they're athletes. And I think we need to allow them to be athletes. Yeah, you make, you make a great point on that, Randy. Because I, 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 that's the question I always pose. Like if they go and play tennis, they're not playing tennis to become a professional tennis player. They're playing right. tennis because they enjoy playing tennis. Right. And football should be no different. Like you're coming here to play football, not to become a professional football player. You're coming here because they enjoy playing football. So, um, and I think it's trying to educate parents and kids that, like, if you go and play a, I don't know, you go swimming, there's no expectations that you're going to go on and be a, a professional swimmer. But actually, it may be really good for your, for your health. It may be really good because you enjoy it. It may be good for you to be in a different environment. It may be really good because you, uh, you've got some friends there. Like, there's loads of, loads of benefits for it. It isn't just about the outcome of going on being a professional within that. And, uh, you know, and actually, if the kids love those other sports, if they don't make it as a football player, they may go on and be really good at another sport and actually go and flourish and be better at that sport than they would be as a footballer anyway. So, um, yeah, I think that's there's some real value in it. And I think like you've touched on, Randy, because they're in so much, it's so important that they get opportunities to, to do other things. And we as an organisation and as coaches encourage them to do that and don't take those opportunities away. So. Absolutely. Brilliant. I think that's the uh, ideal spot to uh, round round things off for for this session. So, uh, yeah, just like to give a, a big thank you to to Ross Brooks. Thanks, Steve. Really enjoyed it, and uh, appreciate you connecting, Randy. And I've been really enjoyed uh, listening to you, Randy. And um, yeah, it's amazing how many crossover messages. I didn't think I'd have that with a. Uh, with a nice hockey coach but um but yeah it's it's been really good so yeah thank you thanks for having me it was uh very i, I hope it was informative for anybody who's viewing it because it was very informative from my standpoint it's it's interesting to talk to other coaches regardless of the sport to see because sometimes we we still don't know whether we're on the right track like i have beliefs that i think and strong beliefs in how things should be done but Lots of the things that I talk about and think about, Ross had the same views on, and it, it gives me the impression that I, we are are on the right track with what we're trying to do for these athletes, and it's it was good, very informative. From from my, I, I enjoyed it. I it was great. <laughs>